I started reading the passage, uh, not where the text is, but I wanted to quickly give you the context. The Lord gives us some insight into the issues that the church would face in the church age after Pentecost. And uh, did you know that people have problems with each other? Has, have you ever run into that? Has that? Have you ever noticed that? Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's amazing. Uh, did you college students find that out when you went to college and when you had a roommate? Uh, you put three or four people together and you now have four problems, okay? Uh, you get married and you think you have entered bliss. No, two selfish people just got married and you got problems, okay? And uh, God's grace is gonna make it a glorious thing, but that's just reality. You put a bunch of people together in a church, guess what? You got problems if we're not walking with the Lord. But all the sweet unity of a godly church is like heaven on earth. And by the way, there's a taste of heaven here. Thank God for it, don't lose it, don't lose it. You've got a treasure. People all over across this country give their right arm to have what you have. Hungering to have the sweetness uh, of what you have here in this church. But there are issues that come and they come because of sin. Remember, relational problems come because of selfish sin. A lot of it is a sin that's uh, not exposed. It isn't just the relationship problem. And so in those first few verses that I read to you, there's the problem between people and a lot of that comes because of inner sin. And we have an admonition here for believers to uh, get right with one another and for the church to intervene if someone is not willing to get right. You know, to stay stubborn in sin hurts the church. That's right. That's to have unresolved relationship problems hurts the church. You know what the number one relationship problem in those churches is? Marriages. Quiet behind the scenes, unresolved problems in marriages. And the church wonders why it doesn't have power. So there's a lot that could be said here, but the point is that God wants within a church there to be such power and the blessing of God and people loving one another that there can be a constant getting right, solving problems, uh, seeing God's victory over sin and uh, to see the, just the wonderful um, uh, love of God within relationships and victory over sin. By the way, there's not one habit that's, that's represented in this room, not one besetting sin represented by uh, folks here that God cannot give victory starting tonight. He is a God that's already won the victory. And my friends, you need to get a hold of that. All the things that I've preached about your identity with Christ, you are in Christ and Christ is in you. You've got the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you the problem that you have, uh, you think it is so powerful, but when you take the fact that the Holy Spirit indwells you and that your spirit is regenerated and that you are uh, righteous and holy, it is like, uh, the, it is like the, the problem you have is like a pea shooter against an atomic bomb. That's how much power God has in, in comparison to what you think is so strong in your life. Oh, I'd love to preach on that. There's no need to have ongoing sin. Amen. Just be honest. Let's get this stuff, uh, the whole idea here is let's get it out because churches need to be unified. Right. It's not just you having victory. You need to have victory for this church to have victory. And this, this whole matter of synthesizing prayer that we're gonna be looking at, this corporate prayer, is about bringing a church into the place where you're praying people into victory so that they can see others say that there, that there is that much fruit that comes from truly abiding in Christ. And that's why every one of you that have Sunday school classes, that have groups that you work with, that you're discipling, I'm telling you, powerful prayer will make a difference in those folks' lives. Well, that is the background. I want to look at our text here, which uh, starts in verse 19. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Wow, did you notice there's another one of those great promises? If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, whatsoever ye shall ask, it shall be done. Folks, God means what he says. 
And when a church prays according to the pattern of scripture, you can see ongoing answers to prayer as a church. I had to learn this over the years. I shared some things with you the other day, but uh, this matter of the importance of corporate prayer. It was back about 1995 as we had our, our victory conferences starting. It was about a couple of years after that that uh, the Lord began to uh, tell us that we needed to pray over those uh, times, uh, those conferences, or we were, it, was, it was fruitless to have them. We didn't want to just have another preacher's meeting. And so we began to have whatever speaker could come in for a few days, a time of fasting and prayer together. And those were blessed times. I was so busy trying to get ready for those conferences. The first couple of years, I would make token uh, appearances uh, at the times we were, we usually were about an hour or so away from where we were and just in a place that we could concentrate on prayer. And God really convicted me. And so I began to take that time of prayer and uh, fasting very seriously. And I'm telling you, when you start praying with other people, and especially at times when it's the right thing to fast, you begin to see yourself as you really are. You begin to see the need of the hour as it really is. The things of life that so distract us and clutter our minds begins to go away. And hour after hour after hour of praying together can change your whole perspective. And I began to see my life change as God really worked me over during those prayer meetings. And by the time we got to the conference, we knew God was going to work. We were in desperate need in those days of just some of the simple truths of being filled with the Spirit and sanctification by grace alone. Some of this had been a little bit lost in fundamentalism. By the way, there's no new truth, <laughs> okay? It's just reclaiming truth that already has and while all the... Uh, the great men of God have preached over the years, uh, but it's easy. We got into sort of a work mentality as, as a movement, depending upon ourselves. And God broke our hearts. And I began to realize this praying with one another is a precious thing. And then God began to do a work in my heart. I shared that with you in 2002 and began to teach me the matter of corporate prayer, sympathizing prayer the symphony of prayer, and, uh, and God began to work. And I would want to give you just a couple of quick illustrations as we begin. First of all, God began to work in our leadership. And so our administrative staff began to take hours to pray, and God began to change us as a staff. I'm very thankful that a number of our administrative staff have been there for over 20 years. And I think part of that is those times of prayer knit our hearts together. I remember we were uh, in uh, a time in which we were, uh, at the Heritage Center, it's a good name, isn't it? Uh, the Heritage Center, uh, our major uh, building for the college, uh, we couldn't get it started uh, like we wanted to. We, didn't, we just couldn't close the gap because I wasn't asking our people to give all the money. So we were praying in the money. And um, we had $212,000 that we needed to, for the beginning of that building. And we really started praying as a church, but especially as, an, as a staff, sought the Lord, had some precious times together. Then one week before graduation, and that was our burden to be able to, to see God work uh, at that time, um, we uh, had an uh, a, uh, unusual thing happen. Um, one of our faculty members had been sending out letters to foundations, and, and uh, you don't, you know, that kind of thing moves slowly if anything's going to happen. Well, we got a, a letter back, and uh, the man that led that foundation said, I'm interested. I, I like what I see here and send me information. And that was encouraging. That was a token for good. I, I found that letter on sun, Sunday morning. That would encourage me. But I knew that that wouldn't help us for a week from uh, that Sunday for the, our graduation offering and to encourage our people by starting the Heritage Center. And so our people sent off all of the prospectus and everything about it uh, to uh, this 
Foundation on Monday. We had a Wednesday administrative staff meeting where we were praying together and really sought the Lord, humbled ourselves and said, Lord, we need help. And we began to be convinced that God was going to use this man to help us. Now there was no way. Uh, this was in May and they met in October for the foundation. Timing isn't good. I don't know if you caught that, that this isn't going to work. But we came out of that meeting absolutely convinced that somehow God was going to work. In fact, the letter had just gotten there. So that, there's just no way. I was visiting someone on Thursday, got a call from one of uh, my assistants and said, you're not gonna believe it. We just got a letter in the mail from uh, that man. He must have mailed it on Monday. And he said, here's a $100,000 check and uh, this is a matching gift, and I want to be part of this. And so God touched his heart, and that's why we had convincement already on Wednesday, and God had just worked. God's the God of eternity, and he was working. And uh, at that uh, commencement service, the offering was taken, and it was literally $212,000 combined, and we were able to have the Heritage Center. That came out of a little prayer meeting of God's people. Another time our staff met together and uh, I mentioned about the land, how we, uh, it was, we needed the land desperately next to us and I'll go to the whole story. But they came down to $425,000 instead of 1.6 million, but they needed it in just a few weeks and uh, the Lord just wouldn't let me borrow. Now, I'm not afraid of borrowing, but uh, the bank had already said, yes, oh yeah, that was a good deal. They'd be glad to loan that to us. But the Lord just said, no plan B. I want you just to raise the money. How am I gonna do that? You know, 425,000 back then was a lot to raise in a couple weeks. You know, that's not something you just do. Well, uh, we were in the, a, an administrative staff meeting, praying and praying, and all of a sudden, you tell you one man after another, we need to believe that God's gonna do something today that will challenge our church to give on Sunday to get us started on that. Well, we, we were absolutely confident. We were just rejoicing. And then I, after the prayer meeting is over, I'm thinking, wow, uh, how is that going to happen? You know, you go from real faith to all of a sudden fighting unbelief, you know, like I talked about this morning. I walked out, I walked, literally walked out of the door, struggling on the matter, but I had such peace about it. Walked down the hallway, one of our good men walked up and said, you know, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I can't remember exactly what he said, but God just uh, has stirred me to give a $50,000 matching gift for the land. <laughs> and uh, could you have the folks take an offering this Sunday? Oh, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was shouting. I, you know, I don't believe in dancing, but I was close to it. And uh, especially for a shy Dutchman. I mean, that's really big, you know, for me to do that. And, uh, and God, of course, in those few weeks, we raised the money and God was good. God answers prayer. You see, when you're meeting together, you can hear the voice of the Lord. I won't take much more time on these illustrations. I was preaching on 2 Chronicles 7, 14 on a Sunday morning. And I wasn't that I was super stirred about it. I was certainly stirred with the truth, but it, I wasn't looking for anything unusual to happen except for God's people to get a hold of that great truth. And I was preaching through Second Corinthians, uh, Second Chronicles. And, um, and so I preached and by the, end of the, uh, by the end of the message, I realized God's doing something here. And, uh, and God just broke the invitation wide open. Well, it's Sunday morning. And after, a, and we went into a little bit of a prayer time right there at the altar. And uh, I said, folks, you know, God, this isn't emotional. God can keep this. If he's doing something, come back tonight. Well, I tell you that night, it was packed. I started, I got up, we had a song or two, and I realized I don't even need to preach. God's doing something here. So we just went into a corporate prayer meeting. Of course, we had been doing that for some period of time. And God came down upon that service, three hours plus of seeking the Lord that seemed like 15 minutes. And uh, God did something special for us. By the way, it was during that service, I realized we have the Lord's Supper tonight. Uh, what do I do, Lord? And the Lord said, you know, a Lord's Supper will fit nicely in with a prayer meeting, <laughs> you know. So I snuck around, got my deacons as God, God's people were praying and we just did the different elements of the Lord's Supper right through it. And I'm telling you, as we did each section of the Lord's Supper, people actually weeping over the reality of what Christ did for us. 
That was a miracle. That was not something, I tell you, I did nothing to manipulate that. Corporate prayer is a wonderful thing. Amen. And I've seen God come. We had a conference in 2005. A dear old preacher preached. He was just a few months from death. He threw down his notebook. He just gave an exhortation and God fell upon that audience at 2, by, at 2 p.m. that afternoon. Uh, there, were, there were hundreds, the place was packed and everybody was on their face before God. And I finally had to call the meeting to an end at 5.15 or so just to get ready to, uh, to, uh, to go on. I wish I hadn't stopped to be honest with you, but it was the sweetest time. Perfect symphony of prayer. Now again, folks, God does different things in different places. This doesn't happen to us on a regular basis, but I'm telling you the sweetness of God's presence is in a prayer meeting every time. And sometimes God has to do a special work. So I'm not talking to you about theory here. This is what God wants in a practical reality for your little prayer groups, for whenever this church prays together, whatever it is, whenever the staff, whenever the deacons, our deacons, we pray together. Uh, it, this is what God wants. So taking a long time to get into the, this, but I'm gonna go through this and make this practical to you. Let's look again at these verses, if you would. In verse 19, again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. The dynamic of symphonizing prayer is the first point I'd like to give to you. The word agree comes from a Greek word that if you transliterate it, it would come out almost like symphony. It means to be in agreement. You know, it's wonderful when, when you hear violins and violas and cellos and trumpets and oboes and all playing, but I'm telling you, if they're not symphonizing, it's not really very uh, pleasant to listen to. But boy, if they are in full unity and following the director and ha are following the music perfectly, it just is, it's thrilling. And that's a good idea of what we are talking to about, uh, about here. And God wants to take God's people and bring them under his leadership into unity as they are abiding in Christ and, and this is real and their hearts are being knit together for God's purpose. And so when you have any kind of time of group prayer, here are some practical instructions. Realize that your desire, just like it should be when you have individual prayer, should be that you want to come into the presence of God and therefore you must start by making sure you are truly focused on the Lord. Think about how many times you come to a prayer meeting and your mind is everywhere else. You see, a true corporate prayer meeting, everybody is listening to who's praying. And when the Holy Spirit is working, you become very conscious of the fact that the person praying, God's working in their heart. And it's one after the other, you begin to hear the very heart of God. You begin to get stirred. And you yourself should be in a place in which you're right with God and you, uh, your heart is open to Him and your desire ought to be to be in the presence of God. Dr. Ari Torrey uh, uh, spoke of this in the book that your pastor talked about. Speaking about Acts chapter 12, where they were praying together as a church, he said, some years ago in our church in Chicago, before we began the great Saturday night prayer meetings to pray for a worldwide revival, a little group of us, uh, a little group of us used to meet every Saturday night for prayer, to pray for God's blessing upon the work of the morrow. Never more than a handful of people came, but we had wonderful times of blessing. One night after we had gathered together, I arose to open the meeting and said to those gathered together, now we're going to kneel in prayer and every one of you feel at liberty to ask for what God puts into your heart to ask for. But be sure that you do not utter a word of prayer until you have really come into the presence of God and know that you're talking to him. Now folks, that's why you need to know how to do that individually. You see, if that's a regular basis in your individual prayer life, you come together with this church to pray, you need to know ex the, exactly what that means to have your heart open to the Lord so that you can be a channel of blessing and unite in that prayer time. 
Let me go on. Then we knelt in prayer. A friend of mine, a businessman, had come in just before I said that. One day the following week, I met him and he said to me, Mr. Torrey, I ought to be ashamed to confess it, but do you know that, that uh, the thought you threw out last Saturday night, just before we knelt in prayer, that no one of us should utter a syllable of prayer until we had really come into the presence of God and knew that we were talking to him was an entirely new thought to me and it has transformed my prayer life. Folks, it's a business meeting with God when we come together to pray. When you divide into prayer groups or you pray together, well, oftentimes we just pray the whole church together or whatever you do, do not have a perfunctory attitude toward that. That's not some nice little exercise. We are, we are meeting with God to do God's business. We're wanting to hear from God things happen around the world because of a prayer meeting like that. The history of the church will be formed by prayer meetings like that. In fact, when we get to heaven, we're going to find out that it is a prayer of God's people that has made this church what it is. And there have been times we are pastor and your leadership and you as a church body have claimed things from God and that's what's made the difference. And so we need to understand when we come, we need to be very aware of the presence of God. Now, when a, the prayer meeting is opened up, the Spirit of God is more than able to control that prayer meeting. I have been in prayer meetings where there have been hundreds and hundreds of people, and one person after another person in beautiful order prays as the Holy Spirit leads them. Nothing is out of order. It's just amazing. You know, God's able to handle that kind of thing. I would encourage you, and, um, and again, however your pastor leads, but I would encourage you, if you're leading a small group, don't just go around the table. Let the Holy Spirit decide who's going to pray. Pray as God touches you. And when you do that, one of the things that's very important, be brief. Do not catch up on your prayer life in a corporate prayer meeting. Everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, in fact, you will find a long, long, long prayer will just kill a prayer meeting for a while. Because the Lord is working and it needs to be just what God has, has put on your heart and then you let God continue to work so everybody can stay focused. Don't let there be any distractions. That's why those of you, let's say you had a prayer meeting here as a church, every one of you that are on security, every one of you that are handling leadership here, you ought to do everything you can to not let any distraction come because Satan doesn't like this. And you need to be praying, Lord, keep this meeting focused. It's more important that you guard a prayer meeting than you guard a preaching meeting. The battle is the hottest in a prayer meeting. When you pray, speak loud enough so that the whole group can hear you because you're doing it together. You say, well, I got a soft voice um, and so therefore I must not pray. You'll be amazed. If you've got something to pray, the Spirit of God will help you pray. Pray loud enough. Make sure you do that. I would, if you need to quote scripture, quote scripture. Let me uh, say that every time the Spirit of God leads, and he will usually lead all the different people within a prayer group to pray. Um, you need to pray at that moment. You know, just like you may have fear to witness to someone or to say a word to a believer that you need to say, there's going to be fear when you're in a public meeting and God's wanting to do something. He's wanting to take what's on your heart and have you pray that to make a difference not only in the prayer, but in the minds and hearts of other people. I'm telling you, some of our sweet Christians that would be considered more of a quiet type of Christian, all of a sudden they'll pray out what they say is so profound, it just sends electricity through the entire crowd. That was God that we just heard. The Spirit of God uh, wants you to pray and it's a, it's a wonderful thing. I won't go through the whole story, but the power of a, of a prayer meeting, when God's people get together. Uh, William Carey went through a lot of trials when he was in India, and he was desperately needing help. Two of his sons really began to walk with God, but one was unconverted. His two sons were, were helping him, 
And there was the meeting of the Baptist Missionary Society back in London. And his friends, Andrew Fuller and John Ryland were preaching. In his discourse, Ryland mentioned that two of Carrie's sons, Felix and William, were devoted to the Lord and to the work of missions. But he said the third one is giving him great uh, pain. And, uh, and, and then all of a sudden, God got a hold of Ryland's heart. And with, uh, with all of his heart, he said, brethren, let us send up a united, universal, and fervent prayer to God for the conversion of Jabez Carey. And 2,000 people fell to their knees to pray. The power of God came upon that prayer meeting. The result, a letter came bearing the news that Jabez had accepted Christ. <laughs> And that it was at the exact hour, the exact hour, that prayer meeting took place. Almost immediately, he applied for missionary service and soon Carrie and his other two sons laid hands on him, ordaining him to the ministry. Carrie wrote, I trust that this will be a matter of everlasting praise. Oh, praise the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. To me, the Lord has been very gracious. I trust all my children love the Lord and three of the four are actually engaged in the most important work of preaching the gospel among the heathen. Oh, I'm telling you, it's amazing. I remember in a great prayer meeting we had in our conference uh, uh, back, um, actually it was that 2005 prayer meeting one man got up and talked about how hard his Islamic brother was and that he was pleading for his soul. It just caught the whole crowd. We'd been praying for a couple hours and uh, we began to pray and believe God. And then there was great rejoicing that uh, he was going to be saved. And in this case, it was a very difficult situation. Two weeks later, he accepted Christ as the Savior. Got under conviction two weeks before. How did that happen? It's exciting, folks. The most powerful entity on earth is the local church and God's people. Number two, the dynamic of supernatural partnership. Again, as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them. The Holy Spirit is the conductor of any prayer meeting of God's people. And we need to let him work and move. That's why we have to be abiding in Christ. That's why we need to come in filled with the Spirit, having a heart of wanting to serve him, knowing what it means to pray. Do you see how your individual prayer life has an enormous impact upon this church? I'm telling you, you let 50 people who've been walking with God and been in the presence of God gather together in this church to pray. And it, it, I can't explain to you what happens. I'm not talking about emotions. There is just the reality. And faith is built. You can trust God. Listen, folks, every need you have here, and on, honestly, I believe God's going to do great things. You need, to, you need more things to be able to have people. Where to put them? God has no problem to God, but there's got to be some people to pray about it. Right. You're going to need miracles. Right. You've seen miracles, and God wants you to pray four great miracles. Now I'm going to read a long um, quote here if you'll stay with me. I believe it'll help you. Referring to this promise again, R.A. Torrey, I refer to the same book again, said, it is one of the most frequently misquoted and most constantly abused promises of the scripture. It is often quoted as if it read this way. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth to ask anything, it shall be done for them and my Father which, who is in heaven. But it actually reads, again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them and my Father who is in heaven. Someone may say, I don't see any essential difference. Let me explain it to you. Someone else has a burden on his heart. He comes to you and asks you to unite with him in praying for this thing and you consent and you both pray for it. Now you are agreed in praying, but you are not agreed as, at all as touching the thing that you ask. He asks for it because he intensely desires it. You ask for it simply because he asks you to ask for it. You are not at all agreed as touching the thing that you ask. But when God by his Holy Spirit puts the same burden on two hearts and they thus in the unity of the Spirit pray for the same thing, there is not power enough on earth or in hell to keep them from getting it. 
our Heavenly Father will do for them the thing that they ask. You see, the Spirit of God needs to be allowed to lead a prayer meeting. I mentioned as we talked about these great promises that when we're walking with God, we can always have answers to prayer. But I said, you know, our hearts oftentimes are deceitful, even when we're endeavoring to walk with God. That's why I love corporate prayer meetings. Sometimes I'm absolutely convinced, Pastor, that this is what we ought to do. In my soul, I've been praying about it. I'm stirred about it. But I still, you know how it is, individually, when you're leading. But then I come in and our leadership is praying or we'll have a revival prayer meeting every Saturday praying or our men are praying on a Saturday morning or the whole church is praying and I'll bring up this matter to the people and ask them to pray about it. And as we go through that prayer meeting, all of a sudden, one person is touched. Another person is touched. Another person is touched. And I hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and what God has confirmed in my heart gets doubly, triply, quadruply uh, reinforced. And then when we decide to do something, it's because the Holy Spirit has touched our hearts to do it. And God will meet that need. That's why husband wife prayer is important. That's why family altar is important. By the way, don't go through a little motion at family altar, have corporate prayer. I and mean, we've had some times as a family where we've cried out to God. And I'm, I'm telling you, when you cry out to God with little children there, God, <laughs> he answers those prayers. I remember we prayed and, and my wife just simply had said, you know, I can't find any apples right now. And so uh, kids started praying for apples. Well, you know, I could have gone and got apples, but very fervent about new, fresh apples, you know, right from Wisconsin. And, uh, and so they claimed it. <laughs> just a few minutes later, a missionary uh, to Korea, stopped at the door and said, you know, I was just traveling through Wisconsin. God put a burden on my heart to, to uh, give you a big bag of apples. So here's a big bag of apples. And my wife and I are amazed. Our kids go, of course, you know, that's exactly what God does. So a uh, corporate prayer meeting with even the family is a sweet thing. And it's amazing uh, what the Lord will do. He just smiles. He just loves to do that. He has no problem in uh, working things through. But boy, I tell you what, you got a got somebody you're burdened for in this church. You got a burden for somebody that's fallen away. You're burdened for that lost family member. You're burdened to see God reach a certain group of people. And you begin to start praying and God touches your heart that he's going to do it. And you plead with God. I'm, that's when you start seeing the mighty power of God working. The Holy Spirit gives divine authority to the church as they follow his truth and pray according to the truth. And the Holy Spirit will give strength to pray earnestly and, and read. Don't you love to be in a prayer meeting when it's real? It's open. It's just genuine. That's what you want. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. Finney tells how a lifeless prayer meeting before he was saved almost made him an atheist. He says, this inconsistency, the fact that these Christians prayed so much and were not answered was a sad stumbling block to me. I knew not what to make of it. And back then he, when he was asked if he did not desire their prayers, he said, no, I'm conscious that I'm a sinner, but I do not see that it will do any good for you to pray for me for you're constantly asking, but you do not receive. People do watch our prayer lives, your family members. Can I just be straightforward with you, adults? The group over here need to see answers to prayer. And you need to stick your neck out and believe God when God stirs your heart. I hear all the time testimonies of young people, oh, I remember when God answered that prayer when we prayed together. Those are stakes in the ground for not only us as adults, but for our children. In this wicked secular world, don't you think God is interested in doing a whole lot of miracles to show how real he is and glorify himself? I believe so. Let's look at the dynamic of spiritual position. In the last part of, of uh, verse 18 there, it says, uh, you have, I'm sorry, verse 19 
it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. You see, our position in Christ is a wonderful thing. Who's the head of the church? Jesus Christ. When the Spirit of God aligns us with the head and we pray according to Christ's will, do you think the Father is going to answer Christ's petition on our behalf? Absolutely. It will be answered by the Father, and, uh, which is in heaven. And so we need to realize that in our position in Christ, we can come corporately, we're in the presence of God, and we have uh, the right to do that. Now let me give you some practical things here. I'll be done here in just a few moments. When you're praying, speak to God, not to anybody else. Let me say that again. A corporate prayer meeting is not for you to be heard, but by God. And I'm saying this strongly. That's why you've got to have your heart right with God and the spirit of God needs to be leading. We don't need any pontifications. We don't need any announcements. Oh Lord, help all those from A to L to remember to bring salads on Saturday. And Lord, help all those M to Z to bring, remember to bring desserts for our picnic on Saturday. Those kind of things. And by the way, even a testimony in prayer is not speaking to God. You can thank God for doing something. If you have a testimony, by the way, this happens a lot in our prayer meetings. Someone will say, I'm going to, uh, just for a moment, I want to give you a testimony and you'll know why I, I'm doing that in the line of what's going. And they'll give a quick testimony of what God did and it fits right into what we're praying about. That's fine. They're speaking to us. Then you go back and you speak to God. Uh, don't instruct others. Very easy. You get excited about something and then you start preaching to everybody in the prayer. That will not work. No, you are in the presence of God. And, uh, and by the way, God knows your testimony. God knows all of those things. Now at times we can remind him of what we're burdened about. He certainly knows that. But be very careful to speak to God and not to others. And don't, listen, if you're worried about others, you won't pray corporately. If you're worried about what God thinks, you're going to pray when God touches you to pray. Because it's between you and him. I love this illustration of John Hyde, praying Hyde. I knew one of his disciples very well, Silas Fox. I've never seen a man pray like that man prayed. So I can only imagine what it was like for praying Hyde. I have been under deep conviction just in the living room of our home as a child to hear this man talk to his God. Dr. Wilbur Chapman wrote to a friend, I have learned some great lessons concerning prayer. At one of our missions in England, the audience was exceedingly small, but I received a note saying that an American missionary was going to pray for God's blessing down on our work. He was known as praying Hyde. Almost instantly, the tide turned. The hole became packed. And at my first invitation, 50 men accepted Christ as their Savior. As we were leaving, I said, Mr. Hyde, I want you to pray for me. Came to my room, turned the key in the door, dropped to his knees, and waited five minutes without a single syllable coming from his lips. I could hear my own heart thumping in his beating. I felt hot tears running down my face. I knew I was with God. Then, with upturned face, and down while the tears were streaming, he said, Oh, God. Then for five minutes at least, he was still again. And then when he knew that he was talking with God, there came from the depths of his heart such petitions for me as I had never heard before. I rose from my knees to know what real prayer was. We believe that prayer is mighty, and we believe it as we never did before. Dr. Wilbur Chapman was never the same after that. I bring this up, folks. You just let God in your humble way lead you to pray to him and as you're together praying about, as you're following the leadership of your pastor, praying for things or the leader that you have in your prayer meeting. Did you know that if you're walking with God, your simple petition to God that's real and genuine can change the life of someone else forever? I love it when the young people of our church get to hear our adults get a hold of God. Folks, he's real. Amen. He's here tonight. Amen. 
He's in your heart. If you have a heart for God, I'm sure your heart's burning a little bit. You want to, to commune with him. Folks, it's not, it's, there's no talent or gifting in prayer. Nobody's gifted with prayer. Everyone is commanded to pray. It is the very life of the believer. This church needs men and women that know what it means to get into the Holy of Holies and know their God and know the presence of God and come into assemblies like this and your preacher leads you in prayer and you just let God humbly lead you to the throne. You pray when God means for you to pray and the presence of God is real. That's sort of what we call revival. Don't look for some mystical something. There are means to revival, and prayer is the key means for revival. I'll conclude with this point. The dynamic of special appointment, verse 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, does that sound familiar? From John chapter 14, there am I in the midst of them. I've already alluded to this. He's there. He's there. We need Jesus. How can he be the head of our church if we do not know his presence? Your pastor knows him. But you've got to recognize him in your pastor. You've got to know him individually. You can't write on your pastor. He needs you. By the way, I can, and he'll tell you this. I can look out into a crowd and I look out at my church and I see Jesus there and I see Jesus there and I see Jesus there and I see in the eyes of this person over here, they're walking with Jesus. I'm telling you, it changes everything for the preacher. I'm, I know what Jesus looks like because I've seen him believers that are walking with him. What a savior. That's Christianity, folks. Those early believers, they met every, every day. Jesus was in their midst. The power of God caused thousands to be saved. It's no different today. But they prayed. They prayed. Judge Black of Georgia, when he was a young lawyer, was invited to deliver an address, address to welcome the governor of the state on Monday evening. He took great pains to prepare the address, but a telegram came on Monday saying that the governor's visit would be deferred till Wednesday evening. Mr. Black at once wrote the committee that a previous engagement would prevent him from being present on Wednesday evening, though this was the, the key opportunity of his career. Few persons besides the pastor of his church knew that the previous engagement was the prayer meeting he was supposed to be at on Wednesday night. It was that important to that young man and that is exactly why God was able to use him. How important is prayer? Don't be one of those people that when the preacher announces a prayer meeting, you consider that secondary. And I'm gonna end with this, I plead with you. When he announces a prayer meeting, other things need to be moved. You're gonna be there. That's the most important thing you can be at. I'm pleading with you to get a hold of that. That's gonna be the key to the future of this church. Nothing is more important than, our, than meeting with God. I tell you, you need to thank God that you have a preacher that wants his people to meet with God. He knows that this church cannot go to the fullness of where God wants it without this being a praying church. And I believe you're going to be by the grace of God. Oh, what a privilege to pray together. Let me read those verses one more time. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. What are you going to do about prayer? 
Are you going to rearrange your schedule and have an extended time every day with him? It's key for you, your family, and this church. And are you going to follow your pastor's leadership and become part of whatever he lays out as prayer as a church or as groups of, of people? If this group here tonight will just absolutely commit in your heart and even tell your pastor that you are going to, in both of those categories, yield to him, to the Lord. There's no stopping God's working through this body of believers.